Hi, this is Nick Forster. We're going to share one of our favorite E-Town shows from the archives, and it starts right now. Live from E-Town Hall in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, it's E-Town with this week's guests from Devon, England, John Smith, Achievement Award winner, Jordan Casalo, and from Austin, Texas, Patty Griffin. I'm Helen Forster. Join me now in welcoming our host, Nick Forster. Thank you, Helen. Thanks, everybody. Welcome to E-Town Hall. Or we are solar powered on this particularly beautiful day here in Colorado. This is going to be good. Um, John Smith is here from England. So glad he could be with us. As you know, we've been doing this for a while, long enough to where back in 1996, when we first heard uh, Patty Griffin's record called Living With Ghosts, we were able to welcome her to the E-Town stage. And she told us about growing up in the small, sort of fading mill town in Maine and heard her amazing talent as a singer and as a songwriter. And then when uh, Flaming Red came out two years later, once again, she came to visit. Since then, more than 20 years, she has been busy all along. She's put out eight more records. She moved to Austin, won a Grammy, won an Americana Artist of the Year Award. She had her songs featured in film and television shows and in theater productions and recorded by tons of other people, including Linda Ronstadt and Emmylou Harris and Solomon Burke and the Dixie Chicks and Melissa Etheridge and many more. And more importantly, really, her songs came to mean an awful lot to a huge number of people. It's really got inside people's hearts and minds and stayed there. She is also a cancer survivor who had a tough go for a while, even losing her voice for a short period of time, which would be terrifying, I'm sure, for any of us, but especially so for a singer like her. And on the heels of all of that, she's back. She's got a great new record full of songs that kind of touch on her past, her family, some struggles, some tales of strength and discovery and glad she's here. Please help me welcome back to the E-Town stage, Patty Griffin. I went up to the mountain Cause you asked me to Up over the clouds To where the sky was blue And I could see all around me could see all around me everywhere sometimes I feel like I've never been nothing but tired and I'll be working Till the day I expire Sometimes I lay down I lay down No more can I do Then I go on again And on again Because you asked me to Days I look down, afraid I will fall. Oh, yeah, and though the sun shines, I see nothing at all, and I hear your, your sweet voice. Coming and go, coming and go, telling me softly, you love me so. 
the peace from a valley that's just over the mountain. a song called The Wheel. It goes like this.
Thank you. First of all, welcome back. Thank you. And uh, congratulations on so many fronts. And cancer-free, right? That's behind you and all done. You know, anybody who's had cancer will tell you it's yeah. ongoing. You know, yeah. I mean, you got to always be on the lookout. Yeah. But yeah, but I'm, I'm feeling great. That's great. Well, you sound great. And it must Thank have been, you. I just can only imagine for a singer like you to uh, worry even for a minute about um, losing your voice. That must have been terrifying. But you sound yeah. good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, just because you dedicate the record to your mother. And what was she like? My mom's still around. She's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she would want me to say that. <laughs> um, and she's still like, uh, yeah. <laughs> she's a French-Canadian stock, which means she's got French and uh, just about every single thing inside of her. Um, yeah. There's, We did our one of those genetic tests and... She's just a she's complete the UN. mutt. Yeah. yeah. And, she's, you know, Native America, Portuguese, everything. You oh, know, that's cool. North African. I mean, it's really crazy what's in there because of the, the sailing life. And she's comes, she came with this, uh, into my life with this beautiful voice. It was the first voice I ever heard. Oh, cool. And sang constantly. She had seven children in seven years. And so wow. she uh, was very, very... <laughs> Busy. Uh, yeah, and a, and a really a really smart, creative lady yeah. who had no time to sort of do anything but laundry and cook and right. um, make sure everybody had enough for you know many many years really, and on a very very tight budget. My dad was a public school teacher, so she sang constantly. Mm -hmm. When I was really little, there was a record from the library that came to the house, and I think it was someone like Ella Fitzgerald, and I was like. You know, I mean, it was her. Oh, my mom wow. had the smoky, beautiful, strong wow. voice and just singing all the time. Yeah. And so I thought everybody's mom probably sang like that. Yeah. You know? But yeah. no. <laughs> and your dad, your your dad's Irish, so Irish American, Irish -American. first generation. Yeah. yeah. And there is a thing I think it's I don't know whether it's an unfair advantage, but it seems pretty consistent that lots of Irish people are really good singers too. And they love a sad story. Yeah. And I've definitely inherited that. Yeah. From the I, th I think your fans would concur. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's interesting now to just to think about, you know, we are a nation of immigrants, right? And mm -hmm. you live in Texas now, so there's a lot of border talk. And mm -hmm. um, it seems like you're describing such a rich cultural heritage with your parents coming from different places and coming together and raising a family in Maine. It's just you know, we are so enriched by these different traditions and cultures. Well, you know, if you're not an indigenous person and yeah. your ancestors weren't brought here by force, you came here to build a better life. Yeah. And that means there's a lot of people that came over on those boats that were desperate. And I feel like this, you know, the situation at the border is completely complex. But there's enough for all of us. We just have to figure out how to share it properly. It's just common sense to me yeah. Yeah. Uh, to not build future generations of very sad and tolerant people who are subject to the whims of the next loony, mm -hmm. you know, to come along and manipulate them. You know what I'm saying? Sure. I mean, yeah. we need to be taking very good care of people. That's just common sense. If you can't find the compassion in your heart to do that, use your noggin. Yeah. It should be a compassionate thing, of course. I mean, that's where it starts for me and I think most people I know. But it doesn't even make any sense to me to neglect people because they are very, very desperate and poor. It doesn't make economic sense. It doesn't make political sense. It yeah. doesn't make sense. You're right. Hey, in case you just tuned in, you're listening to E-Town. I'm here with Patty Griffin. Um, Sorry, you just opened up this very no, big emotional like can of worms for do you, me. Do you remember where you are? This is E-Town. This is the kind of yeah. stuff we talk about yeah. all the time. Okay, good. <laughs> if it isn't up in your face, and justice is not up in your face, we're not necessarily motivated to right. do anything about it. Yeah. And um, I think we are doomed as a country unless we sort of figure out how to deal with this race issue. How and, to tell and, the, real, the real story. And, and that means all of us getting yeah. doing whatever the next right thing is for us. And I haven't figured it out. And I feel like I've been working on it a while. It's, yeah. it's not easy to figure out as a white person what to do and how to behave. But you do have to step up. Right. There was a letter on your website from Joan Baez talking about kind of the same thing that, that we were talking about earlier, that this is an opportunity for us 
each to sort of become a fire line or rise up in community and try to make things better and stand in the way of things that are working against us. And I'm just wondering in this time where there's lots of places where we could point our, our focus and our attention and our efforts, are there things that speak to you particularly? Well, I think definitely the immigration issue and in Texas, there's just humanitarian crisis after humanitarian yeah. crisis with the privately owned prisons, which are really, really difficult for just a regular person to even get into. A lawyer, you know, dealing with the cases of these people that are locked up for no other reason than they are poor and they're here without paperwork. That sort of thing is going, has been going on for years. Yeah. Before you know who was in mm -hmm. office. Yeah. And my father's family, I know, came from the lowest of circumstances. You know, they were just completely poverty stricken and starving. So um, that's why we're all scrappers. Yeah. You know? And uh, yeah. Scrappers with a universal gift that can help bring people together and connect the world and heal the world and make all this stuff better. So keep it oh, up. Oh, yeah. We've got it all. You got Irish. it all. We're going to yeah. fix this. <laughs> All right, we got more music to get back to. Welcome back, if you would, Patty Griffin.
Thank you. That's Patty Griffin, along with David Polkingham and Conrad Shukroon, the world's most efficient band. The new record is called Patty Griffin, and on PGM 30 Tigers Records. They'll be back to play some more music later on in the show. Your visit to E-Town is made possible in part by the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, or SCFD, one of the largest cultural funding mechanisms in the United States, supporting nearly 300 organizations in the greater Denver area. And by our diverse family of NPR affiliates and community stations, plus college and commercial stations, as well as our international stations and podcast subscribers worldwide. Thank you for your continued support. As a reminder, for your viewing pleasure, there are over 2,000 videos on the E-Town YouTube channel, where you can also subscribe in order to stay up to date with our latest offerings. You're listening to E-Town. I'm Nick Forster. You're listening to E-Town. Patty Griffin is going to be back a little later on. Thank you, David, for that good music. And coming up, singer-songwriter from England, John Smith, is here for his first visit. Patty was talking about, uh, um, or actually, I guess I was talking about the letter she got from Joan Baez about how uh, we can all make a difference. Um, and we've been celebrating that, people who make a difference here on the show for a long, long time. Simple stories of small steps that really add up. So we get the stories from listeners like you, and we pass them on. We give some recognition and encouragement to these folks who are literally finding solutions to problems that are not of their own making. Uh, these are generous folks, often volunteers. Um, and although these are small stories with so many big problems floating around in our worlds, these positive victories are especially important these days. So it's the Achievement Award, and here comes Helen Forster to tell you about this week's winner. Thank you, my dear. This week's nominator and our longtime friend Nancy Rosenswag of Boston, Massachusetts, is nominating Jordan Casolo of New York City. Jordan is a successful optometrist. As a young man, he took a gap year between college and optometry school. He was deciding what he wanted to do. And during that time, he went on a hiking trip in Alaska with some friends just by chance. Now, the majestic landscape there, the mountains and so forth, so moved him, it was so profound, that he realized what truly mattered was not what he was going to do in life as a profession, but what kind of life he lived and how he could make a difference for people in need. Then, as a first-year optometry student, while on a mission trip to Mexico, he had a chance meeting with a seven-year-old boy that revealed how he could do just that. Jordan went on to eventually start a nonprofit organization to provide access to vision care to poor people around the world. The group also provides training and employment for women in these underserved areas, improving the quality of life for them and their families. All this while maintaining an active optometry practice and co-authoring a book about the importance and joy of giving back. Well, I'm happy to say that Jordan is joining us now to provide details of how he got there and of the work he continues to do. So please join me in welcoming from New York City, Jordan Casolo. Hey, Jordan, welcome. Hey, Nick. Thanks it's great for being here. First, tell us a little bit about the trip to Mexico. Helen mentioned you went to Mexico. You met a seven-year-old boy. What was that about? Yeah, I was in my first year of optometry school, and there I was in Mexico, my very first patient, and he was a seven-year-old boy. He was from the School for the Blind, so he thought he was blind, his parents thought he was blind, and as we looked at his eyes, we realized he wasn't blind. All he needed was a really, really strong pair of eyeglasses. Wow. And I was the lucky person to put that first pair of glasses on that boy's face, and when the lens is lined up with his eyes, this blank stare of a blind person transformed into this most beautiful smile of joy Wild. that affected both of our lives. Wild. And it brings to mind every time I tell that story, this incredible quote from Mark Twain that talks about how the two most important days in your life are the day that you're born and the day that you find out why. 
And that was the day I found out why. Oh, that's cool. And when I, we came back to the States, we did a little analysis and we realized that of the 2,000 people that we saw, 70% of them just needed a pair of eyeglasses. So I recognize that there's a huge problem out there. Yeah. And so when I finished school, I realized that the work that we were doing, although it was wonderful, it wasn't really creating anything that was sustainable or scalable. So I did a bunch of research and I found an amazing eye hospital in South India that was started to employ what they call compassionate capitalism. It was a way of using business practices and skills to scale models so that they were sustainable. So I wrote away to the founder and I said, I'll volunteer a year of my time if you provide me with room and board. And sure enough, he said, yes, come on down. And this is right after you got out of medical school. Right out school. of school. Mm -hmm. So there were two hospitals, a paying hospital and a free hospital. Yeah. And the paying hospital provided the same level of care that you'd find here in the United States, in Denver or New York, the highest quality of care. And people who had the capacity to pay would pay. And they would run the hospital so efficiently that they would be able to take the resources generated from those paying patients and provide 75% of their care to people in the free hospital. Yeah. So people pay what they can. If they choose to get free services because they really can't afford anything, no questions asked. Yeah. But if they can contribute, and even if it's a few dollars, it's really up to the patient to decide what to pay. Yeah. And so I kept seeing whether I was working in India or Africa or Latin America, that for every person who had a blinding disease, there were 30 people who were visually impaired or blind just because they didn't have a pair of simple eyeglasses. And the part that really got to me was that about half of those people were people in their early 40s who were losing their ability to see up close. As probably many of your audience members know, when they get into their 40s, they can't see their cell phone, they can't sew, you know, thread a needle. And there were millions of people who had that issue. But what would happen right when they were at the height of their productivity right. and right when they were masters of their skills, artisans, tailors, weavers, barbers, mm -hmm. mechanics, they would fall out of the workforce or certainly lose a lot of productivity Wild. because they couldn't focus up close all for the lack of a pair of glasses that I knew I could source in China for 55 cents. And I said, this is a crazy world. we got to change it. And so that was the original idea. The other side of the equation is in those same communities, we saw that there was a huge number of people who are underemployed or unemployed, many women. And so what we said is, why can't we just train those local women to sell those simple reading glasses to their neighbors. They're a consumer product in America that you could just pick off the shelf. Why did you need to send fancy eye doctors halfway around the world to do that? We could just employ the local people oh, wow. who had the capacity to start their own businesses to do it. Yeah. We tested it with 18 women about 15 years ago in India. We sold 800 pair of glasses that year. But now we have over 30,000 women in business in 23 countries, and we sell over 1.3 million pair of glasses a year. That's wild. And, and uh, these are new glasses. So, these are is, new. so this is pretty wild. So um, obviously you're, the model where you're selling the glasses based on what you learned in India, there's a gap between what the business generates and what the costs are. There is. So correct. how do you bridge that gap? So that gap is bridged through philanthropy. So what we like to say is that about a third of our overall revenue as an organization is funded by the poorest people in the world buying glasses at a locally appropriate price, and the other two-thirds is subsidized from philanthropy from the richest people in the world. So it's sort of a price-sharing model. So you live in New York, and you knock on doors, and you raise some dough, and you spread it around. We do. Yeah. Are there people who've been in your world who have uh, been inspired by what you do and are now supportive? Absolutely. As a practicing optometrist, a lot of my patients are big contributors of our work. We actually have an organization that supports both of our work, the Bohemian Foundation, and their oh, yeah. family supports uh -huh. Vision Spring. Yeah. And so they're a wonderful contributor. And so it's uh, far and wide that people are supporting cool. our work. And what about corporations? Do you have retailers or glasses or manufacturers or people who donate or support you? We have a number of different retailers, the most important being Warby Parker, which many people know. Actually, the third employee of Vision Spring was the founder of Warby Parker. Oh, and wow. so he spent five years with us and saw that disconnect between the market and what glasses cost in America. And he created a one for one model. And Vision Spring puts about 80% of uh, Warby Parker's one for one model courses through Vision Spring. That's so cool. And we all know what that can do when you're really empowering women in the community that can make a huge difference, just sort of absolutely to their local society. So, in so many ways. Um, 
How many pairs of glasses have you sold so far? We've reached over six million pair of glasses. Six yeah. million pairs of glasses. Wild. <laughs> and um, and predominantly women employees selling all our glasses over the place. Yeah. in all bunch of different places. We have other models as well where we target corporations who are manufacturing in these yeah. parts of the world to make sure that their workforce has what we call our 2020 workforce. So we work with Levi Strauss and Target and West Elm to make sure that the factories that they're working in, their factory workers are perfectly corrected visually. Yeah. And we have found that once we correct the vision of those factory workers or people who are like picking tea on tea plantations, once they get corrected vision, their productivity increases by 30%. Right. And so for a product, again, that we can source for less than a dollar, we can increase someone's productivity by a third for the next 20 years. Yeah, so there's a huge economic impact for these countries as well as these individuals. Absolutely. We've calculated that our economic impact globally since we've started is over $1.2 billion. That's amazing. That's big numbers. Um, what's your eyesight like? Believe it or not, I've got perfect eyesight. I'm 58. I don't need glasses. So I call it refractive karma. Yeah, that's what. <laughs> um, so if people want to learn more, Jordan, what's the deal? Is there a website they can go to? to learn yeah, there's more? a great website called visionspring.org. Visionspring.org. And it'll tell the whole story. Yeah. And Helen mentioned you also wrote a book or co-authored a book. We did. It's called Dare to Matter, Your Path to Making a Difference Now. Dare to Matter. Your Path to Making a Difference Now, and it's available anywhere you can find books. Anywhere you can find books. Okay. Or glasses, probably. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. true, too. <laughs> um, so once again, the organization is called Vision Spring. The website is visionspring.org. If people want to learn more about the book, the book is called Dare to Matter. And uh, our guest is Jordan Castle, who has a great story. Thank you so much for coming, Jordan, and sharing all this with us. Thank you, Nick. A real privilege to be with you. Thank really you. Great. Congratulations. Thank you, Helen. The winner of this week's Achievement Award, Mr. Jordan Castle, founder so of a nonprofit organization called Vision Spring, making a huge impact all over the world. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Nick. Congratulations. Okay, so I feel like worthless. Man. Although I guess I contribute in a tiny way to spreading the word about wonderful people like Jordan, so I'm very humbled and grateful to be able to be part of that team. Wow, what a great story. If by chance you tuned in in the middle of this segment and you'd like to hear the whole thing, as always, you can find this program for free through your favorite podcast distributors or on our website, etown.org. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Jordan. Such a good story. Thanks, Nancy. We have more music coming up from Patty Griffin and her band in just a little while. Right now, I'm going to tell you about John Smith. He is, um, in my mind anyway, that rare and elusive musical guests that most people haven't heard of or don't know much about, but those who do, they talk about him in uh, reverential tones. Huge respect for him as a songwriter and guitar player in the sort of English folk tradition. He grew up in Devon in England, and he's just a powerful singer and guitarist. Please welcome to E-Town for his first visit, John Smith. Oh, it's nice to be here. It's my first time in E-Town. And I've, I've got Nick here going to colour in some of the gaps for me. And uh, this song is called Hairs on the Mountain. If young girls could sing like blackbirds and thrushes 
How many young men would go beating the bushes? Listen, I, I'm joining the ranks of others who I know don't know much about you. So what kind of music did you grow up listening to, John, when you were a kid? Well, my father has an extensive record collection. So he raised me on everything from Bach to Beethoven, Muddy Waters to Paul Simon, Rikuda. And then later, I got on a really hard diet of Nick Drake and Bert Yanch. Yeah. And John Remble. I was going to say John Remble, yeah. And that's when my life changed completely. Yeah. Yeah. Did you lose all your friends during that phase? <laughs> well, I didn't really have any friends to start with. <laughs> I, I, was, I, was, I was the kid in class who, you know, I, I hated school. I hated it. I hated my teachers. Hated the other kids. You know, I got picked on. <laughs> I was like, I was short and ginger, you know, it's, it's bad news for any sort of adolescent. And then yeah. I just locked myself away and played guitar Yeah. and emerged when I was 16 and six foot two. And, I, <laughs> and, and suddenly <laughs> everybody wanted to be your friend. Well, it was just interesting. I, I went to a school where suddenly there were other people smoking cigarettes and listening to folk music. And I, I was like, I've arrived. Yeah, you found your tribe. Yeah. How old were you when you thought, you know, I think I'm going to make a go of this? Well, I made my first few quid from 
guitar when I was about 15, busking. And that's when I thought, well, maybe this yeah. can work. But then I was really into the theatre as well. I, I was a member of the National Youth Theatre and did that for a while. And really, I was really into it, but I got very sick when I was 17, 18. It knocked me on my back for a year. And it was music that had gotten me through ill health. And so now, um, fast forward to today, uh, yeah. how much of the time do you tour? And what's the ratio between time at home and time on the road? Um, my accountant said, I need to know how many days you're on the road. And I looked through the diary. I was on the road for 205 days last year. And I'll have been on the road about 120, 130 days this year. And it feels, it feels like uh, enough mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I always I aspired to get to 250, but actually... It's taken this long to get to 200 plus, and now I feel like, that, you know, that'll do. It's a good thing you have a picture of your daughter on your pedal board. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, man. It's, you take the rough with the smooth, you know. Yeah. So you're doing some recording and new things coming. People can find you, website, John Smith, somewhere. John Sorry. Smith, johnsmith.com. It's pretty tough to choose a website when your name is John Smith, isn't it? No, I just put John Smith, John Smith. John Smith, John Smith. Okay. Yeah. It's easy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you can find out more at johnsmithjohnsmith.com. Meanwhile, welcome back to the stage here, John Smith. This is a love song, and this is a, just a, a call to arms that we uh, acknowledge the people that we love and that we love them unconditionally despite our own faults and theirs. And this song is called Save My Life. And this features Nick and Helen and the E-Tones. Perhaps I'd rather be alone See my friends and loved ones Just a moment at a time Once in a while the battle of my own I do but thank God what's becoming of my life I'm getting fat and old The pies that be have killed in me The pie that used to hold oh, My love is growing cold Who's a said and I believed it Even if I'm crumbling I can cope, oh, when are you coming down To this hole I call a home Shake off your dress, babe And bless my soul Come on and lift me up To your place on high Take off your dress, babe Save my life Hindsight shone the one to cross my eyes I see the road down which I could live a dozen lives I told myself one little lie I could have made it work I just need a little time Dress, baby, and bless my soul. Come on and lift me up to your place on high. Take off your dress, babe. Save my life. Shake up 
the dress, babe Bless my soul Come on and lift me up To your place on high And take off your dress, babe You saved my life Cheers! Thank you for having me. John Smith, along with the E-Tones, Chris Engelman, Christian Teal, Ron Jolly, and Helen Forrester. The record is called Hummingbird, out on Commoner, 30 Tigers Records. John Smith, and of course, you can learn more at johnsmithjohnsmith.com. This portion of E-Town is made possible by the Bohemian Foundation, building stronger communities through the Bohemian qualities of creativity and imagination. On the web at bohemianfoundation.org. Hey, if you're curious about E-Town's home base, E-Town Hall, our beautiful solar-powered music venue, community center, and recording studio in downtown Boulder, Colorado, you can learn more about it on our website, etown.org. If you happen to tune in late and you've missed some of this week's program, the E-Town Podcast will have this episode and others, along with content from past shows as well. It'll be available for free in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, and other podcast directories. You're listening to E-Town. I'm Nick Forster. I'd like to say hello to our listeners who are hearing E-Town on stations like KNBA in Anchorage, Alaska, on KRFC in Fort Collins, Colorado, and on WYEP in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. As always, if you'd like more information about any of our guests or you want to find out how you can see the videos or more photos about this stuff, lots of stuff is online at etown.org. And don't forget, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find literally a few thousand great videos from E-Town. Um, please welcome back to the stage, if you would, along with her band, David Polkingham and Conrad Shukroon, Patty Griffin. This show is fun.
times that life is a dream But it is I've been dreaming of a crazy machine That's been choking out the love Killing too many dreamers And I just wanna tear that old machine down So ask me what I would dream up in its place Well I dream of a forest where we could all meet Face to face where love could be love And dreams could be dreamers From Austin, Texas, that's Patty Griffin, along with David Polkingham on guitar, and piano, and vocals, Conrad Chacroon, percussion, piano, bass, and vocals, and guitar. The record is called Patty Griffin, and on PGM 30 Tigers. We've got time for one more song. I want to thank everybody for being on the show this week. I want to thank all our guests. John Smith, of course, came the farthest to be with us here today. Thanks to John for making that trek. Um, thanks to our award winner, Jordan Casolo, founder of Vision Spring, helping uh, bring much needed glasses to literally millions of people all over the world. Congratulations and thanks to Jordan. Um, thanks to uh, Helen Forster and the E-Tones. Thanks to Patty Griffin and her band. We picked out a good song for you for our finale. There have been far too many songs. Uh, senseless shootings already this year and we heard that some retailers are now going to stop selling ammunition and so we hope that helps this is a song for them I'm Nick Forster, hope you can be with us next week right here in E-Town Mama take this badge from me I can't use it anymore It's getting dark, too dark to see Feels like I'm knocking on heaven's door Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door Recorded at E-Town Hall and produced by our donor-supported nonprofit organization. To comment about the show, email us at info at etown.org or connect with us on Twitter or on Facebook. Distribution of E-Town is made possible by our family of sponsors, this station, and listeners like you.
This is a production of E-Town.